Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at the Real Science Exchange. HPAI has dominated poultry conversations for much of the spring in the United States, and today we're going to discuss how far we've come as an industry in managing these uh, disease outbreaks and what we continue to learn that will be important as we look to the future. Um, we have a full house here tonight at the Real Science Exchange, welcoming three guests and two co-hosts to the mix. First, let's welcome Dr. Uh, Carol Cardona from the University of Minnesota School of Veterinary Medicine. Carol, you joined us uh, recently on the Real Science Lecture Series to share the details on this topic. Welcome to the pub and tell us uh, your beverage of choice when you're relaxing with friends. Oh, thank you. Um, I like a local, a local brew from Indeed Brewery here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I like their lavender, sunflower, and date uh, ale. Oh, nice. Sounds tasty. Uh, and you brought a couple guests with you tonight. Would you mind introducing them? Well, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Julie Helm. Uh, she's the state um, official state agent in, in uh, South Carolina. And Julie, I'll let you uh, tell us your favorite uh, beverage and also a little bit more about yourself. Well, my favorite beverage is Mountain Dew. Today, <laughs> I'm drinking chocolate milk, but I'm doing it in a local brewery cup. So I think <laughs> <laughs> that counts. <laughs> And our second guest is uh, Maya Walker. Uh, Maya Walker is going to be here to offer us a poultry industry perspective. Maya, what have you got in your class? Um, normally, if it was after hours, it would be in this fancy cup that I got today. Um, mezcal. I am into the mezcal cocktails these days. So a little smoky, a little sweet, um, put some orange liqueur in there as well. Uh, but today it'll be just water. So I work for um, Sparble Companies or Egg Layer based in Minnesota, um, but we have farms in Minnesota, Iowa, and Colorado. So Julie, I got to ask, during my research, I saw a picture of you on the internet, um, uh, and you were the biosecurity queen. So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, you had a tiara, you had everything going. I am the biosecurity queen. I'm limited to the state of South Carolina. However, I can't go outside <laughs> of the realm. Um, yeah, that started as a student, as a veterinary student, I went to several different turkey companies to learn information and meet people. And the way the turkey veterinarians got on and off their farms with putting on protective gear on and off, washing their cars, etc. And so I brought that to my workplace. And because I was very particular about everybody doing it when they came with me to a poultry farm, actually my admin coined me the biosecurity queen. So I started taking that show on the road. Every time we talk to producers, industry, veterinarians, whoever, I actually fully dress up in biosecurity gear. And I also nice. have a sash that says biosecurity queen <laughs> and a tiara. It's probably the only state funded tiara there is in the U.S. <laughs> it kind of gets the, it's being silly, but it's getting the message across something for them to remember. Yeah, so very nice. Excellent. <clears throat> I told you before, I have two co-hosts with me. First, Dr. Uh, uh, Zach Lohman. He's back with us tonight. Zach is in charge of our monogastric technical support team. And um, Zach, what's in your uh, glass tonight? Today, it is just Diet Dr. Pepper. Nothing too exciting, but typically my go-to is Miller Lite, especially okay. during the summer. All right. And then the next co-host is uh, Tom Powell. Tom, you've been around the industry for decades, I might say. Maybe not so many. I don't know. You tell yeah, me. Yeah, uh, let's not go too many decades. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're currently the director of monogastric business for Balchem. Um, right. What are you drinking tonight, Tom? <clears throat> well, I don't know if you guys can see the glass. I uh, can. Okay, Sorry. Bacardi um, is what the glass is, but uh, my go-to is, is probably Woodford Reserve right now. So yep. I'm a bourbon connoisseur. Yep, uh, as is one. Scott. So yeah, yep. I don't know if I'm a connoisseur, but I do drink it. Uh, so uh, in my glass tonight, I for the occasion, I got wild turkey. I wanted something avian. <laughs> so wild turkey 101. So cheers, everybody. Looking forward to a great podcast. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by the Keisher line of chelated minerals. 
Keysher and Keysher Plus deliver proven and consistent bioavailability to maximize performance and a no-frills pricing approach for greater profitability. Visit Balchem.com to learn more. So, Carol, can you get us started? Um, can you tell us about the anatomy of the 2022 uh, outbreak? Of, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is a widespread um, outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza. It uh, was more widespread than any previous outbreak uh, that we've ever had of high path AI in the United States and potentially of any other foreign animal disease in the history of the United States. So more than 30 states have been affected to date in this particular outbreak. Uh, likely um, those numbers will, you know, the, the, uh, we're not having active outbreaks at, at the moment uh, in most states. And so those numbers of active cases have declined and so many fewer states are involved right now. Uh, but yeah, this spring, it was a massive spread uh, across the entire United States, more than 50 million birds infected. Mm. So when were we first alerted to the fact that we may have a problem? Well, I think back in December of 2021, we saw that uh, there was a Eurasian virus uh, that had made its way to Canada. Eurasian vi uh, avian influenza usually respects the boundaries of um, uh, the continents. And uh, North American viruses are what we normally have in the United States. They circulate as low pathogenicity avian influenza viruses. In contrast, the Eurasian continent has experienced since 1996 an ongoing uh, set of outbreaks, so sort of continuous outbreaks annually um, from this goose guandong clade of H5 viruses. It started as an H5N1, first appeared on, an, on the global stage in 1997 in Hong Kong. And through the years, it's caused outbreaks uh, across Asia, different countries in Asia. It's emerged in different forms. And in 2015, it first came to our shores in North America through probably likely through Alaska, although we never detected that link. And then, uh, uh, onto the West Coast. Uh, and this particular virus came in through Eastern Canada, likely through Northern Europe and down into the United States. Hmm. And Maya and Julie, same thing. You, you guys were alerted back in December of 2021. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, they had been, we had been warned that this virus because of what was happening in Asia, but especially in Europe, how they had had this virus that we were, you know, concerned that the wild birds would carry it across. So we were alerted ahead of time and knowing that, you know, we would have to enhance our biosecurity practices to help reduce it. And when it hit, it hit. It hit. Okay. Yep. So as far as preparation goes, I think that kind of started back in 2015. <laughs> we had our, our lessons learned from 2015 going through that outbreak scenario. So as soon as we were hearing um, the whisperings about this coming here in 2022, um, we started having company meetings. We were meeting with industry, other industry um, colleagues, meeting with Dr. Cardona and her team, doing different like scenario options, um, doing our internal biosecurity audits. So the biosecurity queen, I was that person for our company <laughs> going farm to farm, making sure like, is there anything else that we could be looking at that could be a possible risk for us? So um, there's a lot of balls juggling in the air trying to prepare ahead of time um, before it actually hit the United States for us. Mm -hmm. Did you have any that was close to Sparbo there? We, yes, this year. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we did have, unfortunately, one site in Colorado that did get um, infected. Uh, we're on the tail end of that whole cleaning virus elimination process. So we're hoping to repopulate here soon, um, as long as all the samples come back negative and the, the um, site can be released. But we did that, have that. And then um, we did have one pullet location in a quarantine zone down in Iowa, but they stayed clear and free of AI, which is a blessing. Okay. And that's a good point. Every time we have an AI event, and even if it's the mild, low pathogenic strain, every time we have that, the industry and the states and USDA, we always learn something new, something mm -hmm. different, what we could do. So even though the, like the previous big one, 2015, I mean, we all spent the next year prepping our industry, our states. I don't even remember what happened during that year, but I have a lot of stuff made up. Uh, in my 
computer that I did. But, yeah. you know, we had um, smaller cases in High Path AI in 2016, 2017, in 2020, South Carolina had one case. So every year, every time this happens, we learn lessons, what went well, what did not go well, how to change it. And from this outbreak, we are, it's just amazing. We are still always learning more and changing our response plans and what we do on the ground as well. Hmm. Julie, you mentioned low uh, pathogenic uh, avian influenza. What's the difference between low and high? How do you define those two? So that's actually defined by um, USDA, and it's really, you know, how much uh, clinical signs and mortality or death rate occurs in the birds. Okay. So usually with low path, there can be actually no symptoms, no death at all, or mild respiratory, um, some death rate versus high path AI. The virus is essentially hitting all organs of the bird's body, and they are dying. Okay. And and Dr. Helm comes from a chicken state, so she's describing what um, what happens in chickens. But in Minnesota here, we have a lot of turkeys, and so turkeys can actually die pretty easily with a low path avian influenza virus. So high path is defined as what it does in chickens, what the virus does in chickens. So it might not do that in another species, turkeys or ducks or something else. Okay, and what what species do we typically think of? Do we do we get it? Even it's in br broilers, layers, uh, quail. Yes, yes. What do we, and all, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So even, you know, even some of the waterfowl, you know, even in this um, outbreak now, you know, they're getting sick and dying as well. Mm -hmm. And something uh, off to the side, not affected with broilers, but is raptors. So eagles, owls, oh, other wow. in this outbreak. Uh, vultures. We in South Carolina in mid May we had a huge vulture um, die off. So it, it hits a lot of different types of birds. And that was one of the, the differences with the virus this year compared to 2015. You're hearing a lot more of um, the wild bird detections, the raptors, the backyard flocks are getting hit more heavily um, than we had seen in, in the 2015 outbreak. Right. right. And the broilers. And the broilers, right. yeah. Broilers are new compared to 2015. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, my friends, uh, I get this question a lot is what about, I call them the Tweety birds. So these are the songbirds that everybody's feeding out in their front yard. Mm -hmm. And what I've been telling is usually these types of birds are not uh, affected during a high path right. AI break. They don't tend to hang out with the wild ducks. And so I'm telling people, you know, it's okay to feed your little um, wild birds and out in the front yard. But if you have backyard poultry, feed them on the opposite side of the house of the backyard poultry, because that's for different disease reasons why you want to keep those separated. So we have seen we have seen a few cases here in Minnesota in the small songbirds. Um, and interestingly in juncos, so juncos, I don't know, they're the little gray birds that kind of hop around on the ground. And I've sort of been thinking, well, maybe that's how come they access the, the virus is probably hanging out on the ground with where the duck poop might be. But I think, um, uh, in the studies that have been done with songbirds, they don't tend to get infected with the viruses being carried by waterfowl or poultry. Um, they do; they can be infected if you inoculate them, but when they're in cages together, they aren't. And the reason is that if we think about the way that we think about the world, we think about it in a 2D kind of a way. I walk around my house, whatever, you know, I'm on one level. But birds kind of have much more of a 3D look. So mm. um, Tweety birds are tending to circulate up, you know, higher up and, and come into, as, as Dr. Helm was saying, just very little contact with those, with those poultry. We are recommending, just like Dr. Helm was saying, just um, we're not, I'm suggesting that you don't feed your um, small birds when you've got, when you've got small poultry flocks at home as well, or if you're a, a raptor rehabber or something. But um, one of the things you'll learn is the more veterinarians you ask, the more different opinions you'll have. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, I think either position is, is acceptable. You know, we've all become uh, armchair virologists over the last couple of years. <laughs> if uh, if you've been uh, listening to all the podcasts that are out there, I'm kind of curious: is is the 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 virus we have this year is that a variant of the one we had in 2015? And and then when we have the low pathogenic, are are they also variants? Uh, what what can you tell us about that? So this particular strain um, is 
probably a brother or sister of the virus that we had in 2015. So if we think of the granddaddy of this whole line of viruses, um, they emerged first in China in 1996. It's called Goose Guangdong 96. So it's from a goose in Guangdong uh, province, China, southern China. So that those the viruses since then have evolved and changed and mutated. So those some uh, descendants, cousins, third cousins, fifth cousins, you know, it's hard to say, but uh, yeah, they're all related. <laughs> hmm. And also with our low path is we have normal North American low path strains in our wild ducks and geese here in the U.S. And so they carry a whole bunch of different strains, even strains than we can actually get, get as well. And so um, like when those high path strains come across from Europe and Asia, they intermix and they start mixing with our North American strains, which is kind of good because it kind of mellows them out. So I, I always, when I explain it, I say it's like the human influenza. They're always changing every year. That's why we need to get a new human vaccine every year is they're always changing. So good or bad, they're always changing. So this one was very, what we say virulent, very bad for the birds that came across. One thing, I let me correct what I said just now. Uh, so the, the virus that we had in 2015, um, this virus in 2022 is definitely not a descendant of that virus. That oh. virus was eradicated from the United States through the pain and suffering of poultry companies like Maya's that she can tell you about. It, it's a very difficult process that we go through to eliminate it, but it was gone as demonstrated by lots and lots of surveillance and checking and looking. So that virus was eliminated. And this is a new introduction of something that's related. The continuing evolution of these viruses is taking place on the Eurasian continent, not in North America. Hmm. So going with that, do you think we uh, are gonna semi eradicate this uh, version of it or when they migrate again, end of the year that we'll uh, have it pop back up as they come back down? Yes and yes. <laughs> so yes, everything yeah. industry and states and USDA are doing right now, and as uh, Carol said, it's very painful um, to eradicate birds that are infected with it, to stamp it out. Yes, we will get through this particular type of virus. But the threat is always there. It's always there with low path to mutate into high path, like what happened in 2020 in my state. Yes, more birds can come from Europe and Asia, introduced a brand new virus. And I... When I explain this to people, I really like it's easier that we've gone through COVID because your lay person understands now different variants, isolation, mm -hmm. vaccination, you know, all that, all those terms we have always had to explain. They get it now with COVID. And so I just say, hey, this is like COVID, brand new strain. The birds are not immune to it. They, they get infected and they start spreading it. So, yes, the possibility is there. What we don't know is will this happen every year, every spring with a new one coming over? Will it become in what we call endemic? Will it stay here permanently and we'll deal with it? We just don't know. But what we have to do is we have to prepare for it and just mm -hmm. act like it. And so when I'm talking to, whether it's commercial or even the small flocks, I just say, just assume every wild duck and goose out there has avian influenza and then do what you're supposed to do on your farm as if they did to help protect you. Yeah. And along the same lines with that, <clears throat> So we've made a COVID vaccine. We've talked about this. How many more, if we do have more issues with this, how many more uh, big hits do you think the uh, U.S. can take before we start looking into vaccination for it? I'll let Carol talk on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is a this is really a question about trade, and that's the major issue that's standing in in the way. Um, there's some technical issues as well, but primarily this is going to be about trade. And so the major portion of the poultry industry that does in, you know engages in trade is going to be the broiler industry. Uh, and so because they're they would stand to lose the greatest amount of, of, of trading in trading partners in a trade war type of situation. They're the ones who have to um, decide that we're ready for vaccination, and if you will. They're the ones that really have sort of 10 votes and every other industry has one vote. Are there any countries that are actually using a vaccine right now or do they just have them developed just in case? 
Yeah, uh, so there's a couple of countries or several countries that do vaccinate. Um, uh, the, critically, um, China vaccinates and um, also uh, Egypt vaccinates. Um, there are a number of other countries that, you know, we, we talk about uh, in terms of having trade barriers in place, and that's going to be the European Union primarily. Um, me oh, sorry, Mexico also vaccinates for high path AI, but a different strain of high path AI. So the key thing is uh, the Europeans. And so the Europeans are not currently vaccinating, uh, but, you know, my understanding is that France and the Netherlands may be getting close. So I think it's sort of a matter of, of uh, determining how the economics for all of the individual commodities balance out with the pain and suffering for the individual commodities. And then um, how, how much that those barriers can be lowered by potentially other countries starting first. Hmm. So, so how effective are these vaccines against the various variants uh, out there? And how do we stay ahead of that? Well, they can be very effective. Um, they, you know, the there's a number of, of issues with vaccination. Um, Maya can tell you that on on any given day, uh, in her system, she's gonna. I mean, what are the ages of the birds in your system right now, Maya? <laughs> um, they vary. So we're not an all in, an all out um, for ages on our farm. So our Litchfield location, we have about nine barns on that one site, probably close to 1.5 million birds that could be there. Um, and each of those houses are going to be different ages. So um, that spans between we move them at about 18 weeks of age, and then we might keep them to about 80-ish, um, depending on what, what the market's doing and all the other variables that are happening there. So, yeah, that depends. So for a system like that, if you pull the plug and you say, we've got to vaccinate now, you know, would you vaccinate every age group? Would you vaccinate the pullets that are coming onto the farm? You know, what kind of surveillance would you do to make sure that they're vaccinated and they're not also getting infected? Because once they're vaccinated, they really, they really don't die. And so the vaccines are very effective at preventing clinical signs, but they can get infected just like the COVID vaccines, mm -hmm. right? The same thing. It's not a sterilizing immunity. It still can transmit. Ex mm -hmm. Exactly. And so what we don't want to do is we don't want to endanger other farms that are nearby. So 1.5 million infected hens might look like, <laughs> might seem like a big thing. Um, but, you know, it could also be, um, a, it, it, it's likely a very good thing to do. We just have to put in place the surveillance tools and uh, the understanding of everybody knowing what they're doing. So, for example, um, Maya's company would have to take on vaccinating. For example, if we said, well, you have to vaccinate everything in Litchfield, that would be at huge expense, huge time constraints, and there would be a decrease in egg production just from the vaccination and handling each of those birds. That said, you know, it would also protect them. So we're not quite there yet. There's a lot of things to consider, um, but uh, I think we're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maya, I'm curious, were you uh, with Sparbo back in 2015? I was, yep. Yeah. Yep, I was and quality manager. Did you guys have any issues uh, then? We did have some challenges then as well. Um, mainly, it was just our, uh, I shouldn't say just, um, it was our contract producers, our smaller growers that we work with um, that were hit and impacted then. Um, none of our large facilities had any issues at that time. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your key learnings that maybe you've employed this last time? Yeah, um, I think the biggest piece that we've learned is um, just making sure that we have everything tidied up from a biosecurity standpoint. It's, it was a repeat conversation of you're only as good as your weakest link. You're only as good as your weakest link. So that one time you got to run out of the barn real quick to get something that could be the one time that you're introducing it into your houses. Um, I think the challenge with that is we also have, you could have, and this is an industry-wide thing, you have turnover of employees. So it's a constant um, retraining that you're doing, constant monitoring of that. Um, and we can only control what we can control, right? So there's still cases that are getting introduced where you really can't even track in from an epi study where it came from because the virus started in the middle of the house. But um, 
the other piece is uh, communication, both internally and externally. Um, the biggest difference between 2015 and 2022, our amount of communication with our customers, with industry, with our industry peers, um, increased vastly. We were having conversations, um, almost kind of beg, borrow, and steal sessions of how can you share best practices um, between each other, um, and and just preparing as best we can um, on an internal standpoint too, where all of our departments know what the worst case scenario is going to be, how we're prepping for that from a sales aspect, accounting aspect, um, outside of just ops and having those conversations and just open lines of communication. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maya, I'm curious, maybe this is more of a question for Julie, but um, you said you're not sure where the where the infection came from in yeah. 2015. Is it possible that the, the there's other reservoirs of the virus that's non-avian? Uh, Humans, that, uh, rodents. What do we know about that? That would be a great question for Dr. Cardona or Julie. I would say, <laughs> in a general, uh, when we're talking about just viruses and, and biosecurity in general, absolutely. Other, we have pest control that carry different viruses and bacteria into the houses and things like that. So whether it's flies, rodents, um, that's mm -hmm. definitely a possibility for sure. Mm -hmm. But I'll let them chime in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll let Carol take that because <laughs> I found, well, I'll say one thing that was new. I know they did studies in 2015 and what threw me and I had to add it to my biosecurity talks was, um, was it cottontail rabbits? Cottontail rabbits. Who knew? Um, rabbits also, that. and skunks and raccoons. Uh, um, and then the possums do it too? Uh, I don't remember that possums were, maybe they were. Um, but the other thing, since then, there's been a couple of studies on uh, cats, you know, in the New York area um, with uh, H7 viruses that came from the live bird markets or that the only known avian source was live bird markets. And that uh, the last time the H7 had been seen in the markets was five years before. And then suddenly it's in the cats, too. So, you know, uh, yeah. Um, and the other one, I think we strongly suspect, I mean, we know that foxes have, um, you know, been detected as positives in this outbreak, uh, but I strongly suspect that domesticated dogs are a potential host, if not a host. Uh, so they've gotten avian strains of influenza in the past. Uh, so given in it, if they were exposed, I think they would also get infected. That's is, really oh, good information. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was saying that's really good information because I'm thinking about my smaller contract growers, right, who have their barn cats, their dogs on site coming up to the barns and yeah. things like that, where, no, you really need to be thinking about keeping them separate from, from your farms. Yeah, when I talk to the commercial growers as well as the small flocks, I say keep your pests, which are like mice and rats, and your pets, dogs and cats, out of the barn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. Now, is it pathogenic to these other species as well? Never say never with influenza. Influenza is, is always variable, but um, usually it's not going to be pathogenic. I think we saw in the foxes, they probably got a big dose. Uh, it got into their brains um, and mm. it was pathogenic. I think some of the cats in New York um, had pathogen, you know, were ill, but some of the, some others were not. Um, I think the, the raccoons and the skunks haven't shown clinical signs per se. So it's hard to say. <laughs> never say never. What about humans? So humans, um, to, to my understanding, we haven't seen anybody infected with this particular strain of the virus. Uh, but uh, so I would say non-pathogenic. So if it's present, <laughs> if it got into someone, uh, you know, undetected, it it's because they didn't have any clinical signs at all. Uh, all people who work in, in intensive, intensive exposure situations are monitored by local health departments, can, you know, really rigorously. So I don't think that we really saw anybody infected. In the past, of course, in Hong Kong, when this, you know, the, the, the granddaddy first emerged from this family of viruses, 
it was the first time we thought we learned that humans could actually be infected with avian strains of influenza viruses. We didn't think that was possible before. So um, I think it was five or seven people died in that outbreak in Hong Kong. So yeah, uh, influenza always is a threat. <laughs> um. Yeah, just, uh, I guess, in the line of questions here, uh, backyard flocks really, uh, I think, are, are my biggest worrisome when it comes to uh, AI outbreaks uh, because of maybe lack of knowledge. I, I think as commercial companies, we, we certainly uh, uh, do a lot more things uh, to help prevent the spread, but can you touch on that? I mean, is, is what are, what are your biggest fears around spreading of the disease? Well, I mean, you're right. Mostly the the small flocks because they don't know about avian influenza. They don't know about biosecurity in general. Um, so when this first occurred here um, recently, we put on a huge backyard biosecurity campaign. And so I have like a small flock email list. I always send out information. We started Facebook. Uh, Instagram, things that, you know, I didn't even do. I had to learn how to do. I had to make Facebook videos and all this stuff about biosecurity trying to catch their eye. What is interesting is um, in this outbreak, half the cases are commercial and half the cases are actually back your flock. So, you know, it was kind of one, you know, and in 2015, it was a few backyard and mostly commercial. So I know sometimes unfairly the back flocks are playing for a lot of things. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there that keep close flocks and they don't have disease issues, but they do need the education to know what's going on, to be alerted, as well as the commercial industry. The backyard industry needs to be alerted as well and to give the, those biosecurity pointers on what to do to help protect their flocks. And we find here in, in Minnesota, I completely agree with, with uh, Julie. Um, I think uh, the other thing to mention is that many of the people that are have birds that are classified as backyard flocks do a variety of different things with those birds. And uh, so you really have to help them address what it is that, that, that they're doing with those birds. So some are niche marketers, some of them are, um, uh, you know, hobbyists, some of them are poultry breeders, some of them are 4-Hers. So, and then there's the person that you think of as the backyard flock owner. So I think those people have slightly different activities and slightly different risks. And so when we really get in there and um, like Dr. Helm has long ongoing relationships with those folks and uh, she can address their specific needs really well. Yeah, I I think as a follow-up to that, uh, another concern is around free range and, and, you know, allowing birds to have more access to, to wild birds. Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts there as, as far as when we get into <clears throat> the, the outbreak area or control areas, should we change our, our practices on uh, how we uh, house the birds? So um, I'll start with that one since I started something last time. But what we, <laughs> what we see is that um, uh, wild birds don't come to poultry farms for no reason. They come because they're attracted. Um, they come for the feed, they come for the water, they come for the puddles. They come because, so here in Minnesota, for years we've had turkeys on range. And that's where we famously learned that when we took the birds off of range and put them into barns, that we could reduce our low path avian influenza cases dramatically. Well, the truth is that there's some other things that we could have tried that potentially would have worked as well. The other thing that happened during that time is people say that the, the flyways shifted west because we stopped feeding all those birds. They stopped flying down through the area that was most affected, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, the, other, the other thing that I will mention is that we've done a lot of work with the upland game bird industry. These are folks that raise um, pheasants and, and other types of birds that are hunted under nets, uh, in, in outdoor pens under nets. 
And they have the same rate of low path AI introductions as our commercial farms do. The commercial farms having the birds housed indoors and the, the upland game birds are outside under nets, okay? So I think there's a couple of, of things that we have to remember and it's probably that if we protect the feed <laughs> and we really attack the feed that those outdoor spaces may be okay. I think though, when you um, look at what happens, if you were to put a camera out, you would see that the ducks and uh, other birds come at night to occupy that land where the chickens are. They don't usually come, except the small songbirds, they don't come during the day uh, because those chickens are, you know, descendants of T-Rex, so they're pretty fierce. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think if we looked at it, if we said, okay, let's, let's, let's net, let's keep those birds out at night, I think we might see a different outcome. So I think exposure is kind of common. We think about it being, you know, this outdoor access thing. I think it's a little different than that. And I think it's really complicated. And uh, so do we take away outdoor access um, with the thought that it's because of high path AI? I don't know. Um, I don't think that we have the data yet back but I wouldn't be surprised if indoor birds were infected at the same rate or greater rate than, than the outdoor birds. Yeah, and I agree with that. I don't think you can blanket no. one procedure with everybody because when I often talk to people, I just ask, do you have a pond, swampy area, lake, do wild ducks or geese land in your pastures yeah. where the birds are? And a lot of times they say, no, we never see anything. So of course the risk is lower versus even like a backyard flock or even a commercial farm that has wild bird access right near them. Their risk is gonna be higher. So I think I always talk to them about what is your risk? How can you change some things during this high risk time? Mm -hmm. And you know to protect yourself uh, versus saying, no, everybody must be shut up and go inside mm -hmm. because one thing, they don't have the buildings for it. So they're made for having their birds outside. So then becomes a welfare issue. The birds are crowded and squished in their houses and they have other issues happen. So you have to kind of work with each system and talk about risk and see how much they're willing to accept. Yeah. Now the keyword I was, I was hearing when you were talking about that is just a site specific biosecurity. Um, and just knowing even within our company, season to season, depending on what's happening, the biosecurity is going to look different depending on mm -hmm. what's going on. And you have to be adaptable to that. Um, there, are, there are times where it may be a lower risk because um, there's also a cost that comes with biosecurity that, that the, yeah. the industry does incur. Um, and you just have to balance that and find that balance um, when you're when you're going season to season with these different things. So. You're right, Maya. There's a there's a cost of biosecurity, but there's also a, a cost to infection. And so I, I'm mm -hmm. curious, um, what kind of impact has it had on Sparbo with yeah. with the, this year? And and then. What have you seen also with other players in the industry? Yeah, in I can't tell you, impact. I don't have an, an actual number for Sparvo, um, but it, we did take a significant hit when it hit um, our, our Colorado facility. Um, just to give example, so we, that farm was hit mm, late April and we still haven't been able to repopulate that site. So the whole, all the customers that we source out of there, they're not getting eggs. They're not getting eggs right now. So um, that means no profit for us on that standpoint. So until we can, and then once we get birds back in, it takes a minute for them to start laying eggs. So, and because we're not an all in all out, it's gonna be a staggered thing. So it's, it, it's a big impact um, economically for us, for sure. And, and she knows it's beyond money. It's mm. emotional, it's mental health. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that with your, yeah. your growers, how it has affected them. Yeah. Um, this was the first time I, even though I was a part of it in 2015, this was the first time I was there on site to see it firsthand and to see um, the mental toll that it takes on the employees, on the owners, on, because you're, the employees are used to taking care of the birds, right? And now they're in a situation where they can't control anything. And, and at the end of the day, they, they feel like they didn't get to do their job correctly, right? Um, even though they did the best that they could and you have to kind of repeat that. So it is, it is hard. And when you have um, contract growers that you're working with and that's, that's all of their livelihood and they don't know 
what's going to happen next um, as far as are they repopulating or not? How does that look? Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions when you're going through this process because you don't know step to step how long things are going to take, um, the challenges that you're going to face. You can prepare all day and there's still going to be something that you didn't prepare for that you have to adjust for and adapt to so it's a huge it's a huge emotional toll mental toll physical toll for the employees that are on site um handling birds and and making sure we're, we're doing everything that we can according to usda for depopulation um and virus elimination so it's 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 a lot it's a lot to handle mm -hmm. what is the typical time frame to repopulate, say, with turkeys, broilers, and layers? Mm, I don't know if you could say there's a typical. Um, for layers, I know they say it could it could be around three months at the soonest um, for when you can repopulate your first uh, flock back. And that's that's meaning everything goes as planned. Your your depop goes quickly. Your um, composting or your your disposal methods go as planned. Um, and then when the USDA comes to swab to make sure that your the virus is out of your facility, that goes as planned. So I, there's a lot of steps in that process. Um, I don't know if Carol or Julie, you guys can speak to the turkeys or broilers. I think the turkeys have been about two months, but sometimes it stretches into three months as well. Um, and I can't, I can't speak to the broilers. Yeah, I would think the broilers would be similar to meat turkeys. In our 2020, where we just had the one farm, I was thinking it was about a, um, about a month, month and a half before he went through all the steps and was able to repopulate. Mm -hmm. How long is the virus uh, viable on fomites? Well, it depends a lot. And so <laughs> if it's if it's wet and it's cold, uh, you know, years, right? That's how we Is preserve right? it in a freezer. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> so if it's uh, hot and uh, dry, um, I'm going to give it a week, um, you know. So where to, the the big question i think is to go to the biosecurity queen where does it survive right the cold the cool moist yeah, areas yeah protected by either organic material it can live in those like those ponds in the mm -hmm. cold and i don't have number stats in my brain but in those ponds i remember it could be like months in those ponds and even in the summer i think remember when water was like 80 degrees it could still be weeks in those mm -hmm. duck ponds so, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so if, if it's protected, and that's the whole point why we're so excited about summer. And even mm -hmm. though it's horrendous temperatures in the south right now, we don't complain a bit because <laughs> heat, UV light, drying out, disinfectants kills the virus. And so mm -hmm. the more heat we have, I think less environmental uh, transmission between, you know, the wild duck area and, and the poultry barns, whether big or small. So bring mm -hmm. on the heat. We want it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maya, let's talk a little bit about the, the consumer. You mentioned that uh, when you guys had to depopulate, uh, consumers are not getting product. Do you have a sense for where they went and um, how hard is it going to be to get them back? Or did they, did they quit eating eggs? They didn't quit eating eggs. Okay. <laughs> um, and so just a quick explanation <laughs> from, from our standpoint, we have um, direct to retail, um, which is like the actual grocery store, or we have a customer and they go direct to retail. And then we have food service customers, which is like restaurants and stuff. So there's a balance between the customers and consumers that we're working with. Um, the customers that we're working with that are going to retail, they have other suppliers that they're utilizing. Um, and we've done some, even some packing in the Midwest for other other egg layers that have gotten hit. So we, we have very friendly relationships when things like that happen, where we try to help each other out where we can to make mm -hmm. sure that there's still eggs as much as we can have in the market in supply. Um, so we do have some really great customers that, that we had conversations with them beforehand as prep of here's a situation, here's what can happen, here's our plan of response to make sure that you still have product coming in as best as we can. Um, and they have been really willing to work with us and, and wait <laughs> um, mm -hmm. or outsource where they can until we can get supply back in to, um, to those locations. So. 
And that's the balance. a very important topic right there because pre-2015, before we got our first big outbreak, when this was high path AI was occurring in other countries, all we heard was consumer buying of poultry meat and eggs crashed. And it is not a food safety issue because these birds do not and their eggs do not go into the market if they have high path AI. So in 2015, USDA did a very good job of saying that educational amount is like, this is not a food safety thing. So in 2015 and even now, we have not had people really backing off and our, our consumer buying is not crashed. Thank goodness. So Maya is able to stay in business, <laughs> even though she has to get eggs from her buddies, her other buddies, which they do all the time in the background. So the client really never knows. <laughs> that yeah. that's, all, that's all happening in the background very quickly to, to keep their clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carol, what kind of impact have you seen the 2015 outbreak and this 2022 outbreak? What kind of impact did it have on, on the industry and players in the industry? So um, I think the, the industry really um, determined after 2015 that they didn't have enough ability to depopulate flocks quickly. Uh, so they really um, changed um, and they, they put onto the USDA and to, onto states this 24 hour rule, you know, so they wanted flocks depopulated as quickly as they were detected and um, in order to prevent that farm to farm spread. So farm to farm spread was the bane of 2015. And in 2022, it appears that we have managed that significantly. And so we haven't seen that farm to farm spread. If the 2015 dynamics were coupled with the 2022 virus transmission dynamics, we wouldn't probably have a single chicken left in the country. It would be a much, much bigger outbreak. And so uh, the impact on the industry has been to devote more time, I think, to preparedness. Um, I think, uh, you know, economically, I, I really can't speak to that. Uh, I do think that, um, there's been a lot more um, a concern around uh, the NPIP, National Poultry Improvement Plan, influenza and biosecurity um, plans and um, rules to try to make sure that we were as prepared as possible. And um, I think then the other thing would be just this kind of how much time and effort the industry puts into sort of that pre-staging of all their emergency stuff. So um, Maya spoke about that a little bit, but I can also tell you here in Minnesota, where we've always had avian influenza because of our large numbers of ducks and then because we have so many turkeys, um, that we have well-defined seasons um, where of concern. So we know when those migrating birds are going through and that we could expect influenza. So during that time, the turkey industry does extra surveillance of all of the turkeys that go to market to make sure that um, they're detecting any cases before they might expose other poultry. Um, we ask our layer companies to do extra testing before they move pullets onto lay farms to make sure that they're not you know, quietly circulating any influenza that could blow up when it gets to a, um, a lay farm. So those things as well are in place. So I think it's more about preparedness. And I don't think, um, I'll leave it, I'll ask Maya too, but uh, I don't think that the industry's made other changes. No, I, I would agree with that statement. Um, the, the preparedness piece, you can't speak of that enough. <laughs> um, there is a quote that I had heard about, you can't you can't prepare for a rainstorm while it's raining. It, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and so doing what you can beforehand, um, when you spoke of the pullet movement, that was something new that we did this year um, that we didn't do in 2015 when we, we needed are we have to move pullets in order to get to the layer farm and to get our eggs and to be sustainable and have that business continuity even when high path ai outbreak is happening right so doing a pre-isolation movement um, where we are shutting down all movement for that 
um, the pullet site and the layer site before birds are moved, making sure there's no chance of a limited chance, I can't say no chance, um, of introduction of the virus on and off those farms um, before moving in addition to extra testing. Um, but I will say one of those things, it's, on, it's an honor system when it comes to that company to company. And so um, we, we have good relationships with our neighbors and we're having conversations with them um, to try to hold each other accountable <laughs> within the industry of saying, yep, we're doing this. Can y'all do this too? Um, having those conversations. When are you guys moving? What's the route that you guys take um, so that we can all just do the best that we can for each other in the industry when we're talking about prevention? So ladies, are there any other key topics that we need to cover? We're getting uh, close to, to the end of our time here, but I want to make sure that we cover everything that needs to get covered. Um, I think just the biggest thing is communication. Um, in addition to all of this is just having that transparency um, within your company and with your colleagues in the industry. We talked a little bit about backyard flocks and their accessibility to this information. Um, we know we have like academia, like extension, um, who are doing the best that they can to reach those populations. But the more we can talk and communicate and reach out to each other, um, letting them know that there's resources. There are so many resources between universities, um, the industry associations, uh, USDA, all of that at our fingertips that there should be no issue on preparation right um, and having those conversations early on to do what we can hmm. and backing on that since i am a, a state person um, <laughs> is for the industry to get to know their state people who are they're going to partner mm -hmm. with in this in a response so like don't get to know who the state veterinarian or the poultry veterinarian for your state is during that rainstorm that Mark <laughs> just talked about that time everybody's stressed um, do it beforehand, get together, go over response things. How do you expect who is going to be in charge of what, how are we going to do things? And so, and then they get to, you know, vice versa, the state people need to get to know their industry and who to contact. Uh, I think it's very important back to that communication. Of course, since I'm biosecurity queen, right, my little crown, <laughs> um, biosecurity every day, every day, every day. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That relationship piece, I'm just going to piggyback on that too, um, that helped things go so smoothly. And to be able to have a Dr. Cardona on speed dial or our, <laughs> our state veterinarian on speed dial, and they, they know our farms, they know our people, they're willing to answer questions um, quickly because they, they have that relationship initially, that is, that is a huge game changer for response. And even in non-response times, um, peace time is what I call that, uh, being able to ask questions and have the, that open dialogue is really good. People are scared to talk to, to state and federal folks mm -hmm. when they, they shouldn't be. <laughs> you want that relationship ahead of time. Mm, oh. Very well. Well, ladies, <clears throat> I'm out of wild turkey. Oh, no. So that means, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that means it's last call. <laughs> I'm out of toilets. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Oh, that's good. <laughs> you have issues. <laughs> you have issues in, in addition to lack of wild turkey. But anyway, <laughs> with that being said, uh, if y'all could kind of give us kind of, you know, one or two key takeaways from your perspective, from your area of expertise that we should take from this conversation, uh, things that we've learned, things that we need to implement in the future, those kinds of things. And I'm going to Tom, I'm going to start with you, Chief. Our last call question is brought to you tonight by Puricol. Look to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem to deliver the highest standards of quality, backed by the strictest process controls, for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you won't find anywhere else. If, if you'll start us off. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> first off, thanks, ladies, for all the great information. Uh, uh, it's really good to, to get information from from different sides of of uh you know this this issue that we're all facing so um scott i i think i've asked all the questions that that i have of them uh but again i just appreciate the uh the candidness and you guys joining us today so yeah absolutely i agree 100 percent, tom zach uh what words of wisdom do you have for us? I think our main takeaway from this is that the uh, virus that we experienced this year is pretty uh, different than what we've experienced in previous years. And biosecurity is always important, but 
I think it's even more important this year and especially going forward because we're not really uh, sure what may pop up next or what we may see next year. All right. Maya, thank you for joining us tonight. You've been a great guest. I've appreciated uh, your comments. Uh, what, what final uh, thoughts would you leave with our audience? I'm going to leave two words. Prepare, prepare to the point that it becomes habit for you so that when you're in emergency time, it is, you can just, you're automatic with it. Um, and then communication, that's going to be the biggest piece with everybody. Well said. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go to the biosecurity queen. <laughs> uh, what can I say about biosecurity? Um, and I think, and, and we're all this way, and it, including me, we're so busy doing other things that when these large outbreaks and our homework assignments that we still have to do, because of new stuff from this outbreak that we still have to look into and do, is we get busy with other things, and then AI goes away for a while, and then it may come back next spring. So I think we got to be careful and keep that momentum going of finishing our plans, our communication, our exercises, our drills, um, like she said, so that it just becomes common knowledge. When I make the call to somebody going, hey, you have avian influenza, they're like, okay, doc, I know what we're going to do, you know. Hmm. And Carol, I want to thank you for the, the webinar you did earlier and mm -hmm. this podcast. It's, it's quickly becoming one of my favorites. Thank you for the <laughs> star-studded uh, guests that you brought with you. Uh, they've been excellent. Um, would you give us just a few final words as we close out here tonight? Always, always learn. Learn about the situation around you. Uh, you know, Zach and Julie both said this is a different outbreak, different virus. Um, no one's going to have any better information than you will take notes when you're going through these things because uh, that's the only way you'll prepare for the next one. Mm -hmm. Ladies, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and sharing your thoughts on uh, HPIA, uh, HPAI. I got it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to let uh, it go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, all that you do for the industry. So I want to thank you for that. Zach and Tom, thanks for joining uh, tonight, joining the conversation. Appreciate your questions. Uh, and I look forward to having you back here again uh, on the Real Science Exchange. And as always, like to thank our uh, loyal listeners for, for joining us again. I hope you learned something. Hope you had some fun and hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.